So my name is Sasha Litvinsova, and um, I'm a filmmaker. And the last three of my films I've made with different collaborators after uh, you know working alone for several years. Um, and both Daniel and I are doing practice-based PhDs at Goldsmiths. And mine um, is around the idea of geological filmmaking. And I can specifically explore the relationship of humanity, technology, landscape, and geology, but um, through the act of filmmaking and also how filmmaking itself um, reconfigures landscape and is dependent on uh, materials that come from the earth for the technology that um, powers it. Yeah, uh, and I'm Daniel. Um, also working on a PhD project at Goldsmiths. Uh, also a filmmaker, uh, originally from Israel, uh, been making films that deal with the conflict, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, so this film is kind of a collaboration formed around our mutual interests, mutual kind of investigations around both uh, filmmaking, but also politics, the politics of images, but also the politics of this specific conflict that we're dealing with. Because um, essentially the figure of the sinkhole itself collapses the two levels of our two interests. On the one hand, the kind of socio-political level of, and the sovereignty over the surface of the land. And on the other hand, the kind of geological level that becomes inescapable when um, the earth isn't stable anymore in a particular location. Um, and so through this particular um, geological phenomenon that's happening by the Dead Sea, um, our two kind of investigations are necessarily entangled, and so we thought that a collaboration would be most fruitful to explore all the different aspects of this phenomenon. Uh, yes, uh, there is a huge difference. In fact, uh, we had uh, a loose plan of what we want to kind of capture. Uh, we knew, uh, well, we knew about the geologist, the, the person who's also uh, kind of investigating the sinkholes around the shore. Uh, we set a meeting with him, but otherwise um, the environment kind of dictates, in that particular film, not always, the environment uh, dictates, uh, you know, what we basically capture, what we eventually include uh, in the film after a long editing process. Well, not so long, <laughs> but yeah. So definitely, it's less scripted than yeah the yeah the standard process of filmmaking. Um, but in in my case, in my practice, um, I never script anything in advance. Um, and there's kind of two stages where you know you have a particular uh, agenda in mind, a certain set of images even perhaps, but uh, certain themes you want to cover in a certain location that you've chosen for whatever reason in its relationship to those themes. And then in encountering the location, I have to to some extent let go of anything that I might have planned or imagined previously and just respond to actually what is going on on the ground and collect material. And then in the editing, kind of once again, have to almost forget uh, what it was like to be in the location itself and encounter the footage as its own space and try and navigate and sculpt it. Um, and at each stage, of course, everything that you thought before influences how you proceed with your process, but you also have to let go of all the things uh, from previous stages and kind of encounter it anew each time. Um, that's how I stay excited about projects. I mean, it's kind of a yes and a no, because um, on the one hand, uh, for me, I'm from Israel, I'm dealing with the politics of that region, of the, the territories around the Dead Sea, so just uh, for a while now. So obviously, I'm more familiar with the actual um, area and the different uh, forces that shape this particular, particular um, conflict, but then again, Yes, it's a discovery because going there with Sasha and um, looking basically for 
alternative strategies to capture the different forces that make up this conflict is always a discovery. So um, again, it's kind of, uh, you know, this territory, just to give you a very short kind of recap, uh, is basically occupied by the Israeli state from 1967, uh, which means that uh, Israel holds um, Israel holds the the rights over natural resources. <coughs> so everything that is being extracted from the Dead Sea, minerals mostly, the revenue goes to Israel instead of going to Palestine. So in a way, this conflict uh, is ongoing. Uh, but how to capture this conflict and how to basically form this film around the sinkhole is a discovery, definitely, yeah. Um, and I mean, for, for me, it's a simple yes because I've never been to the Dead Sea before. Um, and I guess you hadn't been for quite a long I time. I have been for a while. And, the, and Daniel encounters a stark difference in um, the landscape essentially dying through various things, including the sinkholes, whereas I just encountered the dying landscape on its own terms. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating to see how under, you, know, you see this landscape, also a landscape that is being constantly presented as uh, you know, a tourist attraction in Israel. Uh, getting there together and realizing that this, this landscape is really uh, in the process of rapid decay and in fact, uh, the infrastructure around is dilapidating. It's crumbling uh, quite rapidly. So this, you know, this gap between how the landscape is imagined by companies, by the Israeli state for sure, and how we found it is, I think, one of the main kind of, uh, basically the core of the film in many ways, yeah. I think the landscape in many ways in scripts itself uh, on the one hand through the sinkholes which are kind of sudden eruptions and then remain as traces but their direct consequence of various processes both human um, or rather they they're formed through human intervention into existing hydrogeological processes in a way that is then irreversible. And so each sinkhole kind of signifies the weight of the way that the land had been used. And one of the things that's causing them, well, they're caused by the sea level dropping. And one of the major causes of that is um, through derouting fresh water from River Jordan to irrigate fields in the desert, which in itself was a major colonial strategy for seizing Palestinian lands. And so that colonial history ends up having um, this quite violent response from the landscape itself. And so just observing the landscape in the present really lends itself somehow to um, gathering the traces of the political history. Do you want to talk about the people? Just about the, the soldiers, yeah, the soldiers as, you know, those, those three basically characters that are um, weaved into the film and I think uh, in many ways uh, are appearing uh, in a somewhat kind of ghostly manner, uh, haunting in many ways the landscape. Uh, but also uh, I think uh, essentially um, alienated from the, from the landscape. Um, they are there uh, dwelling in many ways, unlike um, what we usually think, um, you know, s the presence of soldiers around this area, which is pretty much an occupied area, uh, is of course daily, um, I mean soldiers are everywhere, but uh, those soldiers are constantly in wait, they're waiting for something, they are there um, to basically, you know, occupy this strip of land, but with no specific goal. I think um, the idea that these, these soldiers are both tourists, which we see them kind of sitting on the beach having their ice cream, but then also eventually reappearing in the desert itself, um, kind of going in a way nowhere. Um, so I think these soldiers are kind of opening up uh, obviously both uh, the question of, of uh, authority, but also uh, the question of um, what kind, what forms of 
kind of human life could the desert actually sustain? And I think uh, we don't really kind of give an answer to that, rather just maybe, you know, proposing some sort of uh, question there. So yeah, and around the question of, uh, of presence, the presence, let's say, of Palestinians, uh, or rather the lack thereof, I think uh, here we were, of course, well aware that on the one hand, you know, we can approach the Palestinians that are making their way into that strip of land, or rather approaching Palestinians that are denied uh, of access. Instead, we wanted to, um, to capture basically this lack, as a, I think as a kind of systematic lack, uh, the lack of representation of Palestinian you know, indigenous people in many ways. Uh, which I think is inseparable from how the land is imagined. So being truthful to this, to the making of that image, I think uh, the lack is, yeah, is, is a very um, important kind of aspect within the landscape, within the, the environment, the lack of um, those to whom this land actually belongs, the Palestinian population, definitely. Well, everyone yeah. is a soldier in Israel. Exactly, yeah. So <laughs> they're, they're very real in the sense that uh, they were there as soldiers. Um, therefore, you embody soldierhood, so to speak, by simply being an Israeli citizen. So yes, they are soldiers, yeah. Well, the, the soldiers are real soldiers in the sense that they had been soldiers, but they're not soldiers currently. And one of them maybe you can tell is Daniel's twin brother. Um, so the soldiers are more actors, um, but all the other people that we encounter um, were just people that we happen to encounter in certain locations. And somehow through trying to explore what kinds of bodies are able to be in these locations and what their reasons for wanting to place themselves in these dying landscapes are, was somehow also a way to navigate the lack of other kinds of bodies. Um, and so when we see the tourists, or when, particularly when we see those five bold men on the beach towards the end, and the way that all these people understand the landscape to be something for them, but for quite different and very consistent specific reasons, or perhaps most pertinently in the contrast between those five men and the hippie prophet who occupy literally the same beach, but with entirely different understandings of what that place is. Um, they were not at all people we thought we would encounter, but then encountering them became something to um, kind of grapple with and try and understand. Mm. I think we're trying to Kind of ultimately, those shots that are not very composed are the ones that um, we were most kind of interested in as a way to subvert the kind of gaze that objectifies a landscape, um, kind of as a critique of the long-standing relationship between visualizing practices, optical technologies, and colonialism, and the way that landscape is instrumentalized both visually and in practice and how you know, extraction and depiction are two sides of the same coin somehow ultimately. But to be able to have those more kind of haptic images, both in the sea and when it pans across the land, mm -hmm. et cetera, um, but have them kind of puncture something. Um, we did have those static shots that create some kind of map of the environment that we can understand. And also all those shots that are quite, um, compose their shots of infrastructure one way or another. And so they're in conversation with their subject formally that way. But then the shots that are handheld are all directly on the beaches that are permeated by sinkholes where it's dangerous to be and no piece of ground is entirely stable. And so the, kind of the camera is literally guided by my cautious steps. And the viewer can kind of feel that, and that's entirely um, on purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, the story, the kind of story that uh, is uh, weaved into the film, the story about a uh, geologist who suddenly falls 
into you know, the soil, into the subterranean, <coughs> and finds himself uh, buried. In a way, it's also a guide, you know, it could be some sort of a guide for an aesthetic strategy that begins with, as Sasha says, um, kind of uh, fixed frames. We be the film begins with a series of very kind of iconic images of the landscape, but gradually we have this kind of arc that slowly, slowly kind of both looks down to the soil, searching for evidences, as the geologist says, but also eventually penetrating through that surface and maybe <coughs> um, you know, re-emerging from within somehow. So this kind of arc that goes from the iconic, from the, the more uh, traditional way of maybe visualizing, imagining a landscape, traditional in the sense, like Sasha says, that the extraction is always within, kind of incorporated into that gaze. Uh, and then going in and following maybe that body of the geologist that also found itself submerged into the subterranean. And of course, the moment that story is delivered about him falling in, there's no image at all. And kind of throughout, we tried to think of what it would mean to have not just an image of a sinkhole, which do happen later in the film, but like what a sinkhole image would look like. An image mm -hmm. that, you know, that behaves in a way the sinkhole behaves, that like punctures something or collapses. Um, you know, surface and depth, et cetera. And maybe that's no image at all. Yeah, so he, um, very simply, he talks about a future, uh, the near future, a uh, future of kind of total annihilation of perhaps a uh, future that goes to the past in many ways. We will no longer have any uh, machines, we will no longer have any images. He basically says that, uh, simply saying, you know, we are following his proposal and kind of um, eliminating the image, uh, perhaps incorporating this lack that he talks about, the lack of representation, into the very representation that we are um, showing. So uh, it's uh, initially, it's listening to what he has to say, how he envisages kind of a, a future um, that um, returns to the kind of, to the maybe direct interaction with the environment. We are living off the land. We are no longer abusing the land, extracting um, you know, goods from the land, but rather living closer with it or in it in many ways. Um, so it's, um, I would say, the, the lack of image, the black screen, is both um, you know, the inability to, to continue that process of capturing the landscape, but also appropriating the landscape to the needs of, let's say, humans or Israeli state, for that case. Um, basically, obfuscating that somehow, I think. And I think not just because he said there would be no images in the future, but just because there are no images of the future. Um, and those two black screens are in conversation with each other because, you know, the geologist having collapsed into the sinkhole has to confront whether the future will arrive, right? Like whether he will survive. And that trying to imagine but not being able to um, imagine the future truly um, is true to both of those um, both of those moments. Yeah, and just to being uh, concrete also around this environment and the kind of uh, the condition of this environment, I would say that the question of the future, of course, it's a kind of universal question um, confronting climate change and all that, but it's also uh, a question that has to do with the long standing you know, colonization of this territory. So colonizing this territory, initially, the purpose was to sustain life, to enable a better life in many ways, to promise some sort of uh, prosperity, um, f you know, to uh, cultivate the land, to enable uh, Israel to maintain itself. But in fact, if we think about the future, or we speculate about the future, this is what he does in many ways, we can also, cons we should also consider um, the possibility that the future actually holds or entails destruction rather than prosperity. So I think he offers this kind of counter image to the settlers, by the way, who are also in the same kind of area. Um, 
against the, you know, the, uh, the image of settler colonialism that foresees the future of prosperity, he basically offers you know, this kind of vacuum, this kind of uh, dead end, maybe. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a question of maybe countering that image to the existing kind of archive. Yeah. Well, we finished with the song, and the song is an image of a distant future that kind of originates in a past, um, right? So it's like a mid 20th century song originally from the 60s, um, here reworked um, as a cover in the 80s, and then reappropriated by this prophet, you know, in the 21st century as a way to justify his reading of the book of Daniel. And there's like this total circular thing going on with time um, in the attempt to imagine a future. And somehow that's entirely relevant to the way that the landscape is behaving and the way that um, various kind of uh, cyclical processes in the landscape um, in their interaction with human events make the future maybe impossible that the humans had planned. Yeah, actually, I would say um, that, you know, it's working with ambience, with the sound that you are kind of taken from, uh, from a certain location, but also, you know, kind of mutating that sound somehow. Uh, and I think um, amplifying certain aspects, um, certain forces that are invisible, basically. So that we can hear a lot of, let's say, electricity is kind of going through the... Uh, the frame, you cannot really see, you know, these kind of channels of communication that are constantly there in the desert somehow. Uh, but I, I think we did try to somehow, you know, pull that out uh, to the foreground, I mean, emphasize that, rather than going with the, you know, with the sound uh, that is recorded in the location as is, this kind of uh, maybe observation film style, I don't know. But yeah, the sound, even when it reads as diegetic, is highly constructed. It's not just, you know, yeah, it's not just a recording of that space. It's as considering what elements <laughs> are present in the space that could make a sound, and then drawing all of them to the foreground. I mean, I guess that's just like really basic sound design. Yeah, no, but um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's also, uh, everything has to do also um, with the process of filmmaking somehow, which I think is really essential because uh, uh, going back to that, let's say, that uh, person that speaks the very last person, the, the prophet, he also didn't want us to take, uh, to record his image, you know. So it's basically also using these obstacles and um, then uh, thinking about um, solutions uh, with the sound it was the same. I mean, um, you know, we get all kinds of possibilities there. Do we struggle with them or do we yeah, go with what uh, uh, the technology or the environment has to offer. And I think uh, definitely the latter, yeah. So in my thesis, um, there are two chapters where, where I end up kind of towards the end of the chapter writing about my own film as a kind of case study. And one of them, they're kind of like mirror images of each other. And one of them is about uh, the problematics of depiction of landscape historically, uh, starting from kind of landscape paintings and maps and the way that uh, kind of dimensionality and objectification works with that. Um, and then, uh, um, and then kind of proposing alternative strategies and then ultimately Solarium being the experiment and trying to implement that and then kind of theorizing that experiment back into the work. And then the other chapter is about um, kind of the invisible and how we make the invisible visible and ultimately kind of technological and scientific progress. Um, and then there's a film I made about asbestos and this kind of relationship between haptics and optics becomes the main kind of point. And so in my case, there's a um, um, yeah, like a question or a prob problematic would arise from theoretical and historical study. 
where in trying to find an answer that um, um, that's somehow like solid and justifiable enough, I will try and experiment with it in practice and see what's possible. Um, so there's like a very strong correlation. Yeah, to start very simply, there is you know this interaction between um, ideas, concepts that you try to shape out, shape and kind of write about. Uh, and then uh, filmmaking and, you know, testing in many ways. Uh, what are the limits of those concepts, which will eventually will allow you to shape new concepts. So it's this kind of cycle that goes between research, but also then going out and leaving your research behind, not coming with any kind of preconceptions. But then this process of filmmaking, I think, feeds back to how you think about uh, a given concept, a given research. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of studying the integration of uh, technologies into warfare in the context of Israel and Palestine, particularly um, how soldiers um, are using, utilizing um, digital technologies to expand sovereignty, the notion of sovereignty, and what are the ramifications of you know, this uh, chaos of interaction between soldiers, and, but also between the environment and the soldiers and the bodies that make up this basically, you know, combination of different forces. So yeah, so for me, this film Salarium is definitely, um, you know, it has to do with my preoccupation with uh, mechanisms of division, let's say, uh, technologies of uh, colonization that are definitely taking uh, shape around that uh, territory, um, but also about the assemblage of different forces that make up this, what we, what we call a military occupation. And so it's not simply legal definitions, it's not simply warfare, you know, violence, but also imaginaries that are somehow entwined into how things are actually happening. So this kind of distance between imagination, political imaginations, and how things are actually operating on the ground. So going out there is essential. I mean, without that, you're stuck with you know, ideas, which could be fascinating, but they tend to be a bit, um, they tend, to, I mean, the, the, what is at stake maybe is not being attuned to how certain forces are actually operating in a given territory. So yeah, definitely it's all about this, it's not even a cycle, it's kind of a chaos of, I think, of lines that goes between how we think about concepts, write about them, and then how we go out and, you know, explore with some of them, but maybe come back with new concepts to, to then be employed. Yeah.